itself to your pure devotee. O my Lord, O primeval philosopher, maintainer of the universe, O regulating principle, destination of the pure devotees, well-wisher of the progenitors of mankind, please remove the effulgence of your transcendental rays so that I can see your form of bliss. You are the eternal supreme personality of Godhead, like unto the sun, as am I. Let this temporary body be burnt to ashes, and let the air of life be merged with the totality of air. Now, O oh my Lord, please remember all my sacrifices, and because you are the ultimate beneficiary, please remember all that I have done for you. O oh my Lord, as powerful as fire, O oh omnipotent one, now I offer all obeisances, falling on the ground at your feet. O oh my Lord, please lead me on the right path to reach you, and since you know all that I have done in the past, please free me from the reactions to my past sins so that there are no hindrance to my progress. Could look at Mantra 10, please, in the purport. The wise have explained. The wise have explained, a little higher for the translation, that one result is derived from the culture of knowledge and that a different result is obtained from the culture of nations. Purport. As advised in chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita, 13, 8 through 12, one should culture knowledge in the following way. One, one should become a perfect gentleman and learn to give proper respect to others. Two, one should not pose himself as a religionist simply for name and fame. Three, one should not become a source of anxiety to others by the actions of his body, by the thoughts of his mind, or by his words. Four, one should learn forbearance even in the face of provocation from others. Five, one should learn to avoid duplicity in his dealings with others. Six, one should search out a bona fide spiritual master who can lead him gradually to the stage of spiritual realization. And one must submit himself to such a spiritual master, render him service, and ask relevant questions. Seven, in order to approach the platform of self-realization, one must follow the regulative principles enjoined in the revealed scriptures. Eight, one must be fixed in the tenets of the revealed scriptures. Nine, one should completely refrain from practices which are detrimental to the interest of self-realization. Ten, one should not accept more than he requires for the maintenance of the body. Eleven, one should not falsely identify himself with the gross material body, nor should one consider those who are related to his body to be his own. Twelve, one should always remember that as long as he has a material body, he must face the miseries of repeated birth, old age, disease, and death. There is no use in making plans to get rid of these miseries of the material body. The best course is to find out the means by which one may regain his spiritual identity. Thirteen, one should not be attached to more than the necessities of life required for spiritual advancement. Fourteen, one should not be more attached to wife, children, and home one should not be more attached to wife, children, and home than the revealed scriptures ordain. Fifteen, one should not be happy or distressed over desirables and undesirables, knowing that such feelings are just created by the mind. Sixteen, one should become an unalloyed devotee of the personality of God at Sri Krishna and serve him with rapt attention. Seventeen, one should develop a liking for the resonance in a secluded place with a calm and quiet atmosphere favorable for spiritual culture, and one should avoid congested places where non-devotees congregate. Eighteen, one should become a scientist or philosopher and conduct research 
into spiritual knowledge, recognizing that spiritual knowledge is permanent, whereas material knowledge ends with the death of the body. These 18 items combine to form a gradual process by which real knowledge can, well, <clears throat> excuse me, where real knowledge can be developed. Except for these, all other methods are considered to be in the category of nescience. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, a great Acharya, maintained that all forms of material knowledge are merely external features of the illusory energy and that by culturing them, one becomes no better than an ass. This same principle is found here in Sri Ashpanishad. By advancement of material knowledge, modern man is simply being converted into an ass. Some materialistic politicians in spiritual guise decry the present system of civilization as satanic, but unfortunately they do not care about the culture of real knowledge as it is described in the Bhagavad Gita. Thus they cannot change the satanic situation. In the modern society, even a boy thinks himself self-sufficient and pays no respect to elderly men. Due to the wrong type of education being imparted in our universities, boys all over the world are giving their elders headaches. Thus, Sri Shapanishad very strongly warns that the culture of nations is different from that of knowledge. The universities are, so to speak, centers of nations only. Consequently, scientists are busy discovering lethal weapons to wipe out the existence of other countries. University students today are not given instructions in the regulatory principles of brahmacharya, celibate student life, nor do they have any faith in the scriptural injunctions. Religious principles are taught for the sake of name and fame only, and not for the sake of practical action. Thus, there is animosity not only in social and political fields, but in the field of religion as well. Nationalism has developed in different parts of the world due to the cultivation of nations by the general people. No one considers that this tiny earth is just a lump of matter floating in immeasurable space along with many other lumps. That's a, in the Bhumi Gita, uh, the Mother Earth personified notices that people are coming and going in the world, especially the kings consider that they are the rulers of various tracts of land and they conquer using their military force other kingdoms and then they rule those and no matter how far they spread their influence they're not satisfied in fact Bhagavatam says after they conquer the land then they're interested in the sea also and we notice from Bhumi's point of view that this is ludicrous because they're being crushed by the time factor, something that Prahlad Maharaj brings up in his prayers to learn Shringadev, Nishpit Yabhanam Upakarsha Vibho Prapannam, that everyone's being crushed by the wheel of time, inexorable time, takes away the possessions, the rulership over vast amounts of land and men and money, and leaves people bereft. But still they, they spill blood and they think that they're so mighty. Bhumi's watching them come and go and fight over uh, a minuscule plot of land for just a few seconds from her point of view. I'm, after all, from the point of view of geological time, the lifespan of a king is minute. And this nationalism also is ludicrous because if one is born in a particular place, considering that this is my land, is simply in the bodily conception of life. And this is called Boma Ijadi. Ija means to worship and Boma means the land that one was born in. So people think that because I was born here, it's a worshipable place. But this is also ridiculous since we're just passing through here. And ultimately we have nothing to do with any particular nationality. But people raise the flag and they sing and Tears come to their eyes and their hair stands on end. That, oh, I'm a member of this great nation. Nationalism has developed in different parts of the world due to the cultivation of nations by the general people. 
No one considers that this tiny earth is just a lump of matter floating in immeasurable space along with many other lumps. In comparison to the vastness of space, these material lumps are like dust particles in the air. Because God has kindly made these lumps of matter complete in themselves, they are perfectly equipped with all necessities for floating in space. Can we have a verse that backs that up? Go ahead. The last sentence, quote a verse. We'll read it again. Last sentence, back up. Where was it? Because God has kindly made these lumps of matter complete in themselves, they are perfectly equipped with all the necessities for floating in space. Quote, Mike's Sing it nicely with the music. Oh. It says, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashashate. And what that's saying is that um, everything in, like everything this universe, everything that the Lord creates is complete. And, like the Lord is also complete. And they're also, like everything He, everything that emanates from Him is complete, like this world. Yeah, well done. Good quotation. It's an important verse. Nicely done. Om Purnam Adah Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachite Purnasya Purnam Adaya Purnameva A lot of Purnams in there. God's so complete. And even though so many complete units emanate from Him, He remains the complete balance. The drivers of our spaceships may be very proud of their advancements, achievements, rather, but they do not consider the supreme driver of these greater, more gigantic spaceships called planets. There are innumerable suns and innumerable planetary systems also. As infinitesimal parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord, we small creatures are trying to dominate these unlimited planets. A verse from the Bhagavad Gita that indicates that the living entity is struggling hard and therefore maintaining the universe. Govinda, go ahead. Give him the mic. It's just after Pumirapo Nalo Vayu Kambano Purriva Cha. Ahankari Timia Bina Prakriti Astada um Apremi Tastonia. Um so Yuko aparayamitas tuanyam prakritam vidime param jiva putam mahabaho ya yedam daryate jagat. So in the Gita, Krishna says, seventh chapter, right? This fifth verse, he says that there's a way in which the living entities are uh, trying to manipulate this material energy. They're animating it because they're struggling hard with it. It's also mentioned in the 15th chapter how the living entities are struggling hard, they're grappling hard with the material nature. Right? Verse. Give it. Mama Vansha Jeeva Loke Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana Mana Shastrari Indriyani Prakriti Sthani Karshiti. Yeah. Means? Means that the living entities are uh, st struggling very hard to maintain uh, maintain the uh, body, which I think it's which is in, encapsulated in the struggling very hard with very the six hard senses, senses, which include the mind. mind. It starts off by saying, Mamai Vamsha Jiva Loke, okay, they're all my parts, my separated parts and parcels. Mamai Vamsha Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana, Manak Shashtan Indriyani Prakriti Stani Karshit. Karshiti means they're struggling hard to maintain. Not very good. Okay, back to the purport. Nice. The span of human life is scheduled for about a hundred years. Thus we take repeated birth and death and are generally frustrated by old age and disease. Yes or yes? yes. The span of human life is scheduled for about a hundred years, although it is gradually decreasing to 20 or 30 years. Thanks to the culture of nations, befooled men have created their own nations within these planets in order to grasp sense enjoyment more effectively for these few years. Such foolish people draw up various plans to render national demarcations perfectly, a task that is totally impossible. 
Yet for this purpose, each and every nation has become a source of anxiety for others. More than 50% of a nation's energy is devoted to defense measures and thus spoiled. No one cares for the cultivation of real knowledge if people are falsely proud of being advanced in both material and spiritual knowledge. Sri Japanishad warns us of this faulty type of education and the Bhagavad Gita gives instructions as to the development of real knowledge. This mantra states that the instructions of vidya, knowledge, must be acquired from a dhira. A dhira is one who is not disturbed by material illusion. No one can be undisturbed unless he is perfectly spiritually realized, at which time one neither hankers nor laments for anything. A dhira realizes that the material body and mind he has acquired by chance through material association are but foreign elements. Therefore, he simply makes the best use of a bad bargain. The material body and mind are bad bargains for the spiritual living entity. The living entity has actual functions in the living spiritual world, but this material world is dead. As long as the living spiritual sparks manipulate the dead lumps of matter, the dead world appears to be a living world. Actually, it is the living souls, the parts and parcels of the supreme living being who move the world. The dhiras have come to know all these facts by hearing them from superior authorities and have realized this knowledge by following the regulative principles. To follow the regulative principles, one must take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master. The transcendental message and regulated, regulative principles come down from the spiritual master to the disciple. Such knowledge does not come in the hazardous way of nescient education. One can become a dhira only by submissively hearing from a bona fide spiritual master. Arjuna, for example, became a dhira by submissively hearing from Lord Krishna, the personality of God in himself. Thus the perfect disciple must be like Arjuna, and the spiritual master must be as good as the Lord himself. This is the process for lear of learning vidya, knowledge from the dhira, the undisturbed. An adhira, one who has not undergone the training of adhira, cannot be an instructive leader. Modern politicians who pose themselves as dhiras are actually adhiras, and one cannot expect perfect knowledge from them. They are simply busy seeing to their own remuneration in dollars and cents. How then can they lead the mass of people to the right path of self-realization? Thus one must hear submissively from adhira in order to attain actual education. Om Tat Sat. So what, what um, points would you like to bring out by, through questions or reflections? Yes. Um, the, the line about how the way one becomes a dhira is by um, submitting to a spiritual master and the knowledge is gained through that process, not through any sort of... Um, knowledge gaining process that might one could you know there's you know in pedagogy we we come up with all these ways that children can build knowledge and those are those are fine for material knowledge but if you apply those same process cognitive processes to spiritual knowledge but without that submission to a bona fide spiritual master um then it it's not actually you can't actually learn it it's this kind of extra secret sauce um and it's a very hard thing to explain to someone actually if it's an, that, that having that experience is is really like a different layer of experience of, of actually hearing from somebody like that why do you think that it's hard for people to hear I mean about it? It, because it I, if I'm telling someone and they've never seen a pure devotee then the best I can do is vouch and and my experience of having seen pure devotees is mediated through me. I'm, 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 the, I'm the only, I'm the like only representative they have. I'm not that good. So, so it's it's it's, and until someone has experienced seeing a pure devotee, then you it's you, you haven't experienced it. It's it's not a, it's it's a unique thing in the world. It's Thank you for the comments. This is something that Prabhupada brought up th throughout the purport that in order to get perfect knowledge, which is the, the categories of knowledge or the means to reach perfect knowledge is not the same type of 
process that you hear about normally in an academic education. There are a lot of elements there that are sort of surprising if someone's unacquainted with the ways of gaining spiritual knowledge. And definitely one of them is mentioned by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, and Prabhupada's paraphrasing those points that Krishna makes and chapter 13, 8 through, eight through 12, Amanit Vam Adam Vipam Acharya Pasanam. Um, Amanit Vam Adam Vipam uh, Himsa Shantir Arjavam. So one of the points is that uh, one should um, worship a bona fide spiritual master. The, sh the, the Shastras say, Yasya Devi Para Bhaktir Yata Tevi Tatagaro Tasyaite Katitahyarta Prakashanti Mahatmanaha. Only to one who has implicit faith in the Guru and Krishna, only to such a person are the tenets of Vedic knowledge uh, automatically and simultaneously revealed. Krishna recommends also in, in the Gita, Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadakshanti de jnanam jnaninas tattvadarshina. That in order to understand the truth, one should approach somebody who's seen it. And what three things does he recommend one do in order to uh, make the relationship proper in approaching such a person? In, according to this verse, yes. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadakshanti te jnanam jnaninas tattvadarshina. Yes, go ahead. Get a different thing? Okay. Yes. Tadvidi pranipatena. So he should offer obeisances. Then pariprashnena, he should ask humbly. And sevaya, he should do some service to the spiritual master. Okay, now you say why you think that's effective. Okay. Or whatever else you were going to say. I, I'll, so you want um, basically to tell why it is effective? You could say whatever you like. I actually, I had another question, but yeah. Okay, go ahead. Actually, um, I was thinking of um, that the spiritual knowledge gets to the next life as well, whereas the material knowledge stays here itself. So... How, because sometimes I feel that it may be possible, but in my heart I don't agree to this when I see, because I don't remember what did I do in my previous spiritual life. There can be exceptions, for example, I have heard that some people can remember their past lives, but for me, I am not able to agree to this, that whatever I did spiritually in my previous life, it is staying with me. So in case you can explain and correct me. Well, in the Gita 6th uh, chapter, Krishna talks about how a person who practices yoga for a short amount of time and then falls down from the path. Yoga brashta means somebody took it up and then they didn't complete it. And he says a person who, who tried for a short amount of time in the next life goes to the heavenly planets, then comes back down to the earthly planet, human form, and is given facility in the uh, family of somebody who's very wealthy. The implication is that uh, in such a place, and Prabhupada talks about this in the culture of India, there's a way in which in wealthy families they usually have their own deities, and you then get an opportunity, you have some leisure time, you're not just piling bricks all day long in order to take up spiritual life. So then, if someone's practiced for a long period of time, then such a person goes to the heavenly planets, comes back down, takes birth in the family of transcendentalists or devotees. And they come right out into the, the world of, like I notice here at ISV, they practically come out of the womb with cartels in their hands. It's like, where's the kirtan? It's like, hey, where'd you come from? So I don't know, some heavenly planet, but I know I was doing this before. Uh, the point is, it's not a random choice. Th this is very clear from the Shastra, that there's uh, a um, karmana daivanetrena jantur deho papataye striya pravishta udanam pumsoreta kanashraya. 
This is uh, Kapiladev. He says that the, 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 the womb that somebody takes birth in as a particle of consciousness is uh, decided by higher authority. It's not some random thing. It's called daiva. It means, I mean, every, practically everything that happens to us in this world is governed by some kind of higher authority. You can't move around the planet without having to fill out forms and uh, be submissive to others. What to speak of in the universal order, which is very much refined. There's a way in which karmana daiva netrina, according to daiva and according to the estimation of your, your karma, the things that you've done, the kind of association you've taken, you're given a, a very specific body. This is something Krishna talks about, how we create our own future by our association. Um, he says, Purusha prakriti stohi punte prakriti jan gunan kananam gunasangosya sarasad yoni janmasu, 1322. And that is that Bhagavad Gita. Because of our association, we uh, develop uh, higher or lower modes and therefore we get higher or lower bodies. It's also a discussion that takes place in the 15th chapter of the Gita where Krishna says that Shotram Chakshu Sparsharam Cha Rasanam Grana Mevacha Adishtayam Manaschayam Vishayan Upasevate according to one's um, association, the modes one's developed, then Daiva, a higher authority, decides what kind of nose you get, what kind of tongue you get, what kind of ears you get. They're custom made specifically because of um, the way we've conducted ourselves in various ways. So that's the science, and how can you understand? We can see from Shastra that there are people who have a clear advantage starting off life immediately within a devotee family. That's not an ordinary thing. And then Krishna says, Mamhi parta vipashrita yepisu papa yonaya striyo vaishas tatashudras tepiyanti paramgatim doesn't matter <laughs> where you take birth. Because in any kind of situation, if you simply take up the process of Krishna consciousness, then you'll immediately be picked up by Krishna and he'll help you from within the heart, externally, he'll make arrangements for you and so forth. So we don't necessarily have to remember what we've done in previous lives, but we can see through the eyes of Shastra. I've seen so many times how people have been spontaneously attracted to the principles of, of bhakti. And it's palpable. It's not some superficial um, desire that they have. They're very deeply invested in it all of a sudden. And this is what, what Krishna says in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, that, that a person, I'll remind that person of what their practice was in their last life. That's why they become so eager to practice in this life. So you can take it that whatever kinds of facilities you've gotten from the beginning of your life was because of your last life. And if you're also experiencing some spontaneous attraction for devotional service, it's definite that you've practiced before and you're being reminded again. I just read the other day where Prabhupada says, said that after many, many births of association with Vaishnavas, one may develop a desire, a strong desire to perform devotional service. The fact that you're here or anybody else is here is a, a very strong indicator of your association. After all, where's everybody else? I mean, there's a few of us here, but where's everybody else right now? They have no, no interest whatsoever, perhaps, many people or no clue about devotional service, that's not an accident. Just a little context, but yes, Prabhu. Yeah, uh, thank you, Prabhu, for the explanation. I uh, just wanted to, I had a follow-up question, like, so a spiritual master, according to Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami in Chaitanya Chaitanya, can be initiating spiritual master or can be instruction. Correct. Uh, so it means both of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when Prabhu mentions a spiritual master in that is correct. There are three types of spiritual masters mentioned in the Chaitanya Charnarita. The Vartmana Prarakshaka Guru is the one who shows one the path. For instance, Bilva Mangal Thakur was shown the path to devotional service by his girlfriend. 
As at that time, he was very interested and in, he had a very strong love interest and he was going out of his way to visit his girlfriend regularly. And then a big storm came and he said, I, I have to go see her anyway. I mean, it was a big storm. It's like a typhoon. And there he was trying to make it into, into her uh, gated community. And she had to climb a wall. He had to climb a wall. He had to cross a moat. Along the way, he ended up putting his life in danger in many different ways. And then when he finally got in to see her, she made a comment that changed his life. She said, you know, if you were this interested in God, you'd really be like a sadhu or something like that. <laughs> Too bad you're wasting it on me. And that woke him up. It, just that comment uh, by his girlfriend, Chintamani, made him think that, wow, you know, she's right. It woke something up in him. So later on, after he became a great celebrated pure devotee in his writings, he starts by offering his pranams to Chintamani for showing him the path as a Vartmana Pradakshika guru. And then Kaviraj Goswami describes uh, the Shiksha gurus. The Shiksha gurus give instruction about how to chant Hare Krishna, basically. And they give Sambandha Gyan, knowledge about the Supreme Absolute Truth. Prabhupada says, generally someone who's the Shiksha Guru, successful Shiksha Guru for somebody later on becomes the Diksha Guru. Kind of natural. Prabhupada's God brother, B.R. Sridhar Maharaj used to say that, that the, um, the Guru captures the disciple by Shiksha and the disciple catches the guru by diksha. <laughs> Meaning that, that, you know, the guru goes around and speaks. Guru means somebody who's speaking on behalf of Krishna. Really, speak, knows Bhagavad Gita and knows how to speak it. If you know, how to, if you know Bhagavad Gita and you're practicing it and you know, a few, you know enough of the verses to present it, you're a guru for sure. You can go around and liberate everybody by teaching them what Krishna taught. That's, you just have to represent according to your realization. And then when people hear it and they suddenly wake up and they become attached to you, then they'll come after you and they'll say, now you have to give me initiation. Then you're caught. <laughs> so that's what it means. They, they catch each other. So then there's the shiksha, these shiksha gurus. They're, uh, uh, they can be unlimited. There's, there's no limit to how many shiksha gurus uh, one can take help from. Of course, there, there are various m moods that are expressed in, in how to take advantage of guru, uh, mentioned by uh, devotees like Narhar Sarkar Thakur in his Govinda Bhajanamrita when he talks about the principle of guru. It's a Bengali book translated. Um, I think Bhakti Trumar tr translated it the last known copy on earth. And in there, there's, there's a definite um, relationship oftentimes between the shiksha and the diksha gurus where the disciple will <coughs> also consult with the diksha guru but, or bring the information that the shiksha gurus are giving. Of course, it's, it's not stereotype. And then... Kaviraj Goswami speaks about Diksha Guru. Diksha Guru means one who uh, gives the mantras and uh, offers uh, initiation into the chanting of Hare Krishna. And uh, of course, which one's more important? The one who uh, helps one the most and where one's getting the most uh, inspiration and, and direction. Any other question about Shiksha Diksha? Pradakshika, yes. Okay. Uh, from the purport, uh, the one of the point was that one should not become a source of anxiety to others by the action of his body, by the thoughts of his mind, or by his words. So I want to know how by the thoughts of his mind we can become the source of anxiety for others by the thoughts of our mind. Well, if, uh, if you're thinking something, it's going to manifest externally sooner or later. If you hold on to a certain mindset, 
then it will manifest in, in, in various ways. Uh, of course, in the Kali Yuga, as Prabhupada expresses in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we're not held responsible for the sins we commit within our mind. But uh, the thoughts within people's minds are often expressed through their bodily activities, their demeanor, and, um, and their words. And in the Kali Yuga, Manda Sumanda Matayo, <laughs> mentioned by Sudha Goswami, or is it by the sages at Naimishanya? Manda Sumanda Matayo means that in the age of Kali, people have really bad thought processes. They, th they really don't think very clearly. They haven't considered things very well. That's why the world's such a mess. Not to be overly pessimistic, but... Thank you, sir. Okay. And also a comment like this purport, there are so many nice points. One Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it amazingly <laughs> Amazing practical? Points. I mean, it's all there in the Sri Sri Yeah. It's, okay. a, it's an excellent book to distribute. <laughs> I mean, just this one purport is just going through the way Prabhupada paraphrases the path of knowledge. It's so understandable and relatable, and it really wants, makes you want to be good, doesn't it? When yes. you hear all those things, doesn't it? Yeah. Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, this, uh, the purport is like amazing. I just was appreciating, or maybe, you know, deepest gratitude for Prabhupada. I mean, I think this uh, issue, we should actually not be, I mean, I'm just thinking in the United Nations, they should become their basic book they should read before they uh, start debating. What How will you implement should. that? What are your plans? <laughs> I think in the United Nations, we should distribute to all of the heads. How? How? The, Tell us the steps. I mean, United Nations, where there is a building, we can stand outside. <laughs> and as they enter, give it. Or, you know, dispatch to the to heads. To New York. Of, to the New York. Yeah, it's a, the United Nations buildings in New York. Yeah. I saw it recently. Not this trip, but the last one on my way to Harlem, I saw it. Yeah. Pradumna, I think, works there. Pradumna Prabhu, Prabhupada's senior disciple. Yeah. So you might want to ask him. I think that you should take it up and see the ways in which you could introduce Shushapanishad or other books to the United Nations. Do a little research. Sure, Maharaj. And s come up with like three to five ideas, a way to get the Shushapanishad into the United Nations. Okay. Sure, Maharaj. You have an idea for this. Yes. I can exactly tell. exactly an idea. There was a pan they had a panel on World Yoga Day, and there were actually a couple different devotees who spoke to the address the United Nations. Okay. Um, so there's, there's something to, you can, we find out who organized that and talk to those two devotees. You there might were at want least to two consult her to start with. I, I'd have to look it up, but there were at least two devotees. Uh, Sundar Gopal Prabhu, and I don't remember the other person's name. Okay, let's look into who it. Actually, who actually had a, they had a whole event at the UN. We should, uh, for the next year, think of ways in which we can get books into the United Nations, especially Sri Shapanishad. Yes, and it, thank you. Any ways that you can do that, catalog them, and we'll celebrate them as the steps as you get closer and closer. Sure, Maharaj. Okay. So, because I was, the, the way Prabhupada in one paragraph made this whole earth look so small. Yes. And as they fight over a tiny piece of land and that the discussion, you yes. know, lobbying, I just thought the moment they understand it, the anxiety they take over, you know, small piece of land or, you know, this nationalism, hopefully they're subdued and they can think beyond. But I'm not convinced you, you're going to take this up, are you? Yes. I'm a, when I was in Chicago, you know what the name of Chicago airport is? O'Hara. It's spelled... Ohio. O apostrophe H A R E. <laughs> we used to, of course, call it O'Hare Airport. <laughs> and Prabhupada used to see it. He came into Chicago twice when I was there and we were distributing books. And he watched us distribute books. The first time he saw us, he was slightly puzzled because we were wearing wigs. So he didn't know exactly why we had hair. We used to have wigs back in the old days. And, um, in, in any case, Prabhupada told my godbrother, <laughs> he told my godbrother that you should approach the, the, uh, the head of the airport and ask them to change the name to Ohare Krishna Airport. <laughs> and he did it. 
Because Prabhupada told him to. So he did it. He didn't think, I don't think, that he, he didn't, I don't know what he thought, but he just did it. So that was interesting. Okay, so other questions? Yes. Uh, just one thing came to mind when uh, Mukhanvind Prabhu asked. So there is uh, one word in Sanskrit, manha stiti mukha vartate. Means whatever is in the mind or in the mana that comes to your face. So indirectly if a person sees your face, then That's true. that can impact. I said demeanor in that litany I gave about possible ways the mind could vary. I mentioned demeanor. Could you look up the word demeanor? Yeah, haven't you ever been around somebody and, and you're like, what? You know, they didn't say anything, but what? <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what you're, I don't like what you're thinking right now. It's like, how do you know? I'm looking at you. I can see the face is the index of the mind. Okay, yes, demeanor. It doesn't get the origin, but it says that demeanor means manner, air, attitude, appearance, look, bearing, carriage, behavior, and conduct. All those things in demeanor. Okay. So any other questions or comments from the purport? Yes, Monisha. Um, I was recently reading a book and it really reflected on the purport of this and how in the Ishapanishad it talks about how like universities are um, the students that graduate from the universities know like more about like numbers and amounts more than morals and values and um, it talked about how if you sow um, a thought you reap an action and you sow an action you reap a habit you sow a habit you reap a character and you sow a character you reap a destiny and um and I thought uh, that was really like it all starts with one thought and how um if we move our inspiration to the right type of knowledge, the right direction, then we can attain perfection. And also in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the 11th canto, 27, 23rd, um, 11, 23, 57, it talks about, the Avanti Brahmana talks about um, how like he crosses, like it's impossible to um, cross the ocean of um, material suffering or like repeated birth and death. And um, And I think, the translation, it talks also about how he takes, um, yeah, it says, I shall cross over the insurmountable ocean of nations by, firm, by being firmly fixed in the service of the lotus feet of Krishna. This was approved by the previous Acharyas who were fixed in firm devotion to the Lord, Paramatma, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And I thought um, how Davanti Brahmana had taken the right inspiration and he followed in the um, footsteps of the previous Acharyas, so he was able to have the faith um, to cross over this ocean of nations. So I just thought. The Pandipit is on <laughs> fire tonight. How do you go? Very nice. That was good. That was really good. Thank you. Yes, Shraddha. Maharaj, I was also thinking that as, um, as instructors or as teachers, how important it is for us to be dhiras, to be dhir, because there the word said that, you know, if you are not a dhir, then it's very, the information will not be imparted properly. People do notice, actually. And by example, when teaches more effectively than by precept. It's a good point. So who knows who Narada Muni was before he was Narada Muni? Yes. Go ahead, give him the mic. He was a son of a maidservant. Actually, that's the right answer. But what was he before that? Do you know what he was before that? No idea. Yes. He was a Gandharva. He was a Gandharva. And um, it's kind of a, not just an instructive story, but also an encouraging story because oftentimes we see a, a pure devotee and then we think that he's always been a pure devotee, but we see the life of Narada Muni as mentioned by himself in the Srimad Bhagavatam, seventh canto, that Narada in his 
a previous life, at least the life he talks about before he became the son of a maidservant, was a Gandharva. And he, was, he had a, a really beautiful face. And he had a great voice. And he used to go to all the kirtans. But he didn't really have any uh, knowledge of kirtan, so he used to sing uh, bhajans about the demigods. And he did so in the in the assembly of pure devotees who took umbrage at his uh, <clears throat> mistake. Which mistake would that be according to the Ten Offenses? Consider the names of demigods like Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma to be equal to or independent of the names of Lord Vishnu. And what's a verse that backs that up? Okay, give the mic. It's in the shloka book. <laughs> what I understand, the second verse is Sivasya Sri Vishnu Riyah Gune Nama Adi Sakalam Dhyya Bhinnam Ya Pashet Sakalu Hari Nama Hita Kara Pretty good, yeah. Okay, but that just names what the what the offense is, right? Where is it in the in the Shastra elsewhere that it mentions this principle? Yes to Brahma Shivadi Dvai Vitai. Yes. Yes to Brahma Di Devatai Samatva Vikshita Sa Pashanti Bhavet Dhruvam. The second two lines. Yes to Brahma Di Devatai. So I'm blanking on the second line. Yes to Narayanam Devam. Brahma Rudra Vitai. Brahma Di Rudra Devatai. Yes to Narayanam Devam, Brahmadi Rudra Devatai, Samatvam Evam Vikshaita, Sa Pashandi Bhavedrum. So a person is known to be a Pashandi, which is not a great term. I mean it's a great term, but it, it's not great being one. It means it means an atheist. Did you find it? Yes to Narayanam Devam, Brahma Rudradi Daivate. Give him the mic. Bart, read it, please. And tell us where it's from. Uh, it's from the Padma Puran. And it says, Yastu Narayanam Devam Brahma Rudradi Dhaivatai Samat Venaiva Vikshita Sapashandi Bhavadrun Bhavadrun Dhruvam. And the translation is A person who considers demigods like Brahma and Shiva to be on an equal level with Narayan is to be considered an offender and an atheist. Yeah, but where does it say that in the Bhagavad Gita? Okay. Shraddha knows, give her the mic. It's ninth chapter, verse number 23, okay. uh, where he says that those who worship the demigods, they worship in the wrong way. They worship Krishna, but they do so in the wrong way. Could you put this verse? Back it up a little, please. Yeah, go ahead. Translation, please. Those who are devotees of other gods and who worship them with faith, actually worship only me, O son of Kunti, but they do so in a wrong way. Avidi purvakam. It's a avidi. It's against the proper method. Although there are parts and parcel of Krishna, it's, it's not the right way. Where else in Bhagavad Gita? This is a very strong principle. Bhavedruvam means it's fixed, fixed principle. Somebody's a prashandi if they don't understand this. So where else in the Gita does Krishna recommend that one not worship demigods or give logic that explains why they should why one should worship him and not demigods yes in the seventh chapter um 20 sec, 23rd verse yes he says antavatu phalam tesham tad bhavat yalpamedasam devan deva yajoyanti mad bhakta yanti mamapi Men of small intelligence worship the demigods and their fruits are limited and temporary. Those who worship the demigods go to the planets of the demigods. But my devotees ultimately reach my supreme planet. Excellent. What else? In the same neighborhood, there's other verses. You might just back up one verse. Go ahead. I was thinking if, if it's Yanti Deva Vritavya. No. You can do Yanti Deva Vritavya, but back up one verse here. Go backwards. Back, 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 back. Back, back, back. There it is. 
Sataya Shadaya Yuktas Tasya Ardanam Ihate Labate Chatata Kaman Mayaiva Vihitan Hitan. And the translation is Endowed with such a faith, he endeavors to worship a particular demigod and obtains his desires, but in actuality these benefits are bestowed by me alone. Strong point. And go one more back. This section is a treasure trove for those who want to explain why one should focus one's attention fully on Krishna. How about this one? Let's say it together. Yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shradayar chitum itchati tasya tasya chalam shradham tameva vidadham yaham I'm in everyone's heart as the super soul. As soon as one desires to worship some demigod, I may th make his face steady so that he can devote himself to that particular deity. Back one more time. You have a point. Uh-oh, this is good stuff. Let's hear the pass to the mic. <laughs> Start over. Dangerous. We heard the word dangerous. It's very dangerous to have even a momentary attraction to the demigods before one has an attraction to Krishna because... You know, if, if, it was, if it was up to me and I had a momentary attraction, well, I have momentary attraction to all kinds of things, but then he kicks in and says, okay, go for it, and man, then you're in the wrong, wrong path. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, in the overall scheme of things, there's a way in which um, the Vedic project is huge, and if somebody's worshiping devas for elevationism, and they're following the, the Shastra, then there is some conception about how one might develop faith in the Devas and in the Shastra and then think, oh, the whole thing has some effect. But in general, for pure devotees, absolutely, it's, it's a um, uh, diversion of one's energies away from the root, yes. I guess on the flip side, I've met at least three devotees who've told me, we, we always ask people, how did you find Krishna? It's like a family tradition. And I've known at least, I have at least three good friends who are now, you know, Mahaprabhu's camp, but they came as uh, Shaivites. Yes. They started with an attraction to Lord Shiva. Sure. And Shiva takes care of his people with the, and he, Vaishnavana, Yatha Shambhu. The whole premise of, of the whole premise, but one of the main themes of the Briyat Bhagavatam Rita is that um, Kamakshi Devi was the uh, the deity of worshipped by uh, the the Brahman from Jyotishthapur, and he, uh, in a dream, had a visitation from Kamakshi Devi, who told who gave him a mantra, and what was that mantra? It was a Gopal mantra. It was a Krishna mantra, and said here. Take this, it's a gift. And so, because he got it from the deity, although he had no idea what it was really, he started chanting the mantra and, and was able to have darshan with, Go, with, uh, <coughs> with Gopal. And, and the mantra started taking him you know, to various realms in order for him to, on his circuitous route, find the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But it came from Kamaksha Devi. Of course, what we're talking about here is really um, having a, a clear idea of the hierarchy that, and that Krishna is the source of all the devas and they're simply parts of him. Even their names are borrowed names from him. It's not illegal to worship the demigods if one has a clear idea that they are all parts of Krishna and they're his servants. And um, we have examples of this. And Prabhupada mentions what I just said, uh, that uh, unless one has this idea that they're the same or they're completely different from one another. Um, for instance, uh, Rukmini, before her abduction by Krishna in the special um, way that he married her by dragging her away from Shishupal and everybody else, uh, was, was praying to uh, Durga, as was the custom, right? And, and what was her prayer? Please get me out of here. <laughs> Please uh, let Krishna appear and, and uh, kidnap me and take me away. And the young gopi girls, of course, were doing a similar thing. 
and um, making their worship and their prayer was, uh, le please let me become uh, Krishna's wife. So um, this principle is very important in the Bhagavad Gita. Many people misunderstand this and they think you can worship any demigod and it's the same as worshiping Krishna or anybody else. This is Mayavad. And it's very prevalent in the world. People don't understand the position of demigods, nor do they read the Bhagavad Gita apparently, which is um, an important, is the most important uh, Shastra for understanding clear knowledge about how to worship Krishna and that he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, yes, Shraddha. I was thinking that even in the Ishupanishad later, it also talks about the, that it's not the same to be worshipping um, one who is supreme and one who is not. Anyad eva or somebody. That's true. Let's look at that verse. It's verse number 13, I think, 1-3. Ishupanishad. Tell us what the verse is. Anyad evahu sam vavad, anyarahur asam vavad, iti shu shu madhiranam yenas tadvij chakshire. And the translation is. It is said that one result is obtained by worshiping the supreme cause of all causes and that another result is obtained by worshiping what is not supreme. All this is heard from the undisturbed authorities who clearly explained it. Is that the verse you wanted? Purport. The system of hearing from undisturbed authorities is approved in this mantra. Unless one hears from a bona fide acharya who is never disturbed by the changes of the material world, one cannot have the real key to transcendental knowledge. The bona fide spiritual master who has also heard the Shruti mantras or Vedic knowledge from his, his undisturbed acharyas never, acharya, never presents anything that is not mentioned in the Vedic literature. In the Bhagavad Gita 9.25, it is clearly said that those who worship the Pitris or forefathers attain the planets of the forefathers that the gross materialists who make plans to remain here stay in this world and that the devotees of the Lord who worship none but Lord Krishna, the supreme cause of all causes, reach him in his spiritual sky. Here also is Sri Ishapanishad. Here also in Sri Ishapanishad, it is verified that one achieves different results by different modes of worship. If we worship the supreme Lord, we will certainly reach him in his eternal abode. And if we worship demigods like the sun god or moon god, we can reach their respective planets without a doubt. And if we wish to remain on this wretched planet with our planning commissions and our stopgap political adjustments, we can certainly do that also. Nowhere in authentic scriptures it is said that one will ultimately reach the, supreme, the same goal by doing anything or worshiping anyone. Such foolish theories are offered by self-made spiritual masters who have no connection with the parampara, the bona fide system of disciplic succession. The bona fide spiritual master cannot say that all paths lead to the same goal and that anyone can attain this as goal by his own mode of worship of the demigods or of the supreme or whatever. Why can't a spiritual master say that all paths lead to the same goal and that one can attain this goal by his own mode of worship? What prevents a spiritual master from doing that? Yes, Shraddha. then you're not following the acharyas and the sampradaya. Okay, can you say more about that logic? It's, you're on the right track. If you're creating your own mode of worship, then it's not a bona fide way of trying to advance in your devotion. It defies the very definition of a, of a guru or a spiritual master, right? Because Krishna is the Adi guru. This is mentioned in the section of the Bhagavatam about Matsya Avatar. It's a wonderful verse there about how Krishna is the Adi Guru, means the original Guru. And anybody else who follows Krishna and who represents what Krishna says 
is also considered a guru because of being a representative of the Adi Guru. So why is it that it's important that we follow what Krishna says and not some person who's affected by the three modes of material nature? Please go ahead. Put forth your theory. <laughs> so those who are under the modes of material nature, we have got um, material senses and which have got four defects. We make um, errors, we, are, we have um, uh, imperfect senses, we have a tendency to be illusioned, we make errors, and we have a tendency to cheat. Cheating. Yeah. So what if, what if somebody is uh, an ordinary person who is under the three modes of material nature, controlled by the modes of material nature, but um, doesn't uh, say anything of his own creation, but simply repeats what he hears from Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and from the bona fide spiritual master who we've heard from Shraddha is one who follows Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. What in that case, what happens in that case? Could somebody uh, be effective, could their words be effective if they are conditioned by the modes of material nature? They have these four defects, yet they don't speak on their own behalf. They simply repeat what Krishna has said or what the bona fide spiritual master has said. Your demeanor is showing me that. See, I can tell what his thoughts are by looking at his demeanor. I'm being affected by his uh, thoughts. Not I in was, a diverse way, but in a good way. I was actually thinking about the previous I see. Thing, which, um, okay, go so ahead. So in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, this um, Shruti Smriti Puranadi Pancharatra Vidhimvina Ekante Ki Harer Bhakti Utpateva Kalpate if, some, if any path doesn't follow Shruti Smriti Puranadi in Puranas, that is nothing but a mere disturbance in the society. So that's why, you know, spiritual, a bona fide spiritual master cannot, cannot, say any, cannot say that, you know, any path will lead to the same destination. That's true, and it's a very good citation, but sooner or later, Prabhu, did he answer my question? My premise was that the person's under the three modes of material nature, they're subject to the four defects. Nonetheless, they restrain themselves and their speech by simply repeating what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita and what they hear from the bona fide spiritual master. Is what they say perfect or not? Yes, Prabhu, it is perfect. Okay, defend your position, please. Um, so Prabhupada, uh, many places he talks about how we, um, if we hear properly from the bona fide source and uh, we represent it without any addition or our own interpretation, then we pass the pure message through the parampara. And of course, uh, Quoting the verse, you know, evam parampara praptam, evam rajarashyo viduhu. The fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says that this uh, divine knowledge was uh, passed through the parampara and the disciplic succession. And uh, uh, thus it was uh, passed um, you know, through many ages. So the knowledge can, um, is actually passed down, it's a descending mercy. And when it's actually properly presented, then uh, without any adulteration, then it, it's bona fide. Okay, Govind. Thank you very much, Sindar Prabhu. Uh, I'm reminded of an incident that happened with Prabhupada. Once Prabhupada was preaching, I've heard this, obviously. So once Prabhupada was preaching and uh, there was a person in the audience who was challenging him very much. He says, why should we believe you? Are you? Do you think you are perfect? But per Prabhupada came back with the response, no, I'm not perfect, but I'm speaking the words of a perfect person. That's why you should believe me. This is the point. And he also said, I'm not liberated. He said, but because I'm repeating the words of Krishna, who's eternally liberated, therefore my... Speech is perfect. So the principle, yes, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, Bhagwan is perfect because uh, Bhagavatam says, uh, it is full of such statements, Vasudev para Veda, Vasudev para Makha, Vasudev param Gyanam, Vasudev param Tapah, Vasudev para Yoga, Vasudev para Kriya, Vasudev varo dharma, Vasudev para Gati. So he is the best, um, uh, even Arjun says that, um, 
So anyway. From Brahma, from Dhamma, Pavitram, Paramam, Param, Purusham, Shashatam, Divyam, Adidevam, Ajam, Vipum. Okay, good. And Shraddha definitely got something here because I'm feeling her thoughts <laughs> through her demeanor. And you got more, okay. So uh, along the same lines of what Govinda Prabhu was saying that um, we say that Krishna is described by Uttam Shlokas and Uttam, shl- Uttam means uh, transcendental. So um, when we are trying to describe Krishna, we have to describe him using Uttam Shlokas. And since we are not Uttam, whatever we say cannot be um, you know, transcendental. So, but if you are repeating something which is transcendental, then it can't be affected by the modes of material nature that we have. And um, there's that Ayur Harati Vayapam San verse. Mm-hmm. So that it says that, you know, he's described in choice transcendental shlokas only. Yes. So it has to come from the right source. Correct. So in the, the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we'll find in the discussion of the personified Vedas, the proposition that the material world has two purposes. One purpose is for material enjoyment, the other is for liberation. And the question comes up that how is it that those who have material bodies and senses can perceive transcendental sound or transmit it since they are using material instruments what to speak of the fact that that sound has to trans for itself or be transferred through a material medium. For instance, the air carries the sound and it touches the ear and so forth. And who knows what the answer to that question is? You only get full credit when you use the microphone. It's all right. Chakudanu Dilaje Janme Janme Prabhu Shesh. It's from Guru Puja, Sri Guru Charna Padma Pai. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Guru Dev is the person who gives us our divine vision, the, the, real, the real eyes. Okay. After and, and in this uh, conundrum about how it is that material senses can perceive spiritual sound, what, what is the answer that's given by the, um, in this section of the prayers personified Vedas? How is it that material senses can perceive transcendental sound? He needs a mic really bad. <laughs> this is lobe. Greed. Okay, go ahead. So I was not thinking about 10th canto actually. I was thinking about Bhakti Rasamit Sindhu. Atha Shri Krishna Namadi Nabhave Grayam Indre Seman Mukhi Jivado Soyam Eva Spurti Ada By the material senses it's very difficult to perceive perceive the Lord, but when uh, one renders service by, uh, by taking Lord's name and eating prasadam, then one can understand, uh, un- understand the Lord. That works. What was the specific point that's made there? Pravishta karna randhrena svanam svanam saruruha dhunoti shamalam krishna salyasyasyatasharat Good, good. Well, tell us wh- why you're citing that verse, please. So how does it apply to the question about how the, question, much, the yes. question was how does sound vibration, transcendental sound vibration, purify us? No, the question was how could you actually transmit transcendental sound vibration in a material medium? We're in the material world, have a material body, have a material eardrum, using the air to transport sound. So how is it? that you get spiritual sound through that mixture of all these material things. That was the question that comes up in the 10th in the canto of Purse Personified Vedas. You want to answer, Malini? Okay, go ahead, support your position and support it very strongly, please. Maybe I'll go down in flames. <laughs> So um, the senses get get transcendentalized. Uh, the material senses get transcendental in the association of transcendental vibrations. As much as when you put iron rod in the fire, it requires the properties of the fire. That is correct. And iha yasse harir darse karmana mansagira niklav apy avasthatum jivan mukta sauchite. 
So even in this uh, world, although they are appear, they are seem to be in a material body, but they are actually one more verse concept. from the Bhagavad Gita: Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagnabhramanohutam, Brahmaivra, Tenagantavyam, Brahmakarma Samadina. Whatever you use in the service of Brahman becomes Brahman itself. But there's a little more to the answer that's given in that chapter. Prayers personified Vedas. Who's a big fan of that chapter? We should have a fan club. <laughs> I mean, that's a chapter that it's for connoisseurs of philosophy because it's long, it's deep, it's so you could live off that for the rest of your life. I mean, it's really relishable, that chapter. It comes right after all the Krishna's sweet, sweet pastimes. Just to make sure you don't start thinking that this is some kind of uh, fairy tale or something like that. It's nailed down tight in the philosophy there. The answer that's given there is because Krishna is a person and he's very much aware of his entire creation and therefore he can interpret the intentions of the person who's speaking uh, Krishna Kata and just as a uh, uh, engineer can flip a switch and you can send electric energy through the heater or through the cooler. So Krishna can transform everything according to one's desire and intention. And if it's being used properly, Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenama mukpayanti te. Krishna's there within the heart. He says very distinctly that he understands when somebody's sincere and they're trying to uh, do devotional service to please him. And therefore, he gives the intelligence by which, by which they can come to him. And Prabhupada mentions in that chapter, the prayer of the sonified Vedas, it's a referendum on whether God's personal or impersonal. And then he explains that if he's personal and he's in full control of his creation, he, and of course he's omnipotent, he can transform the energies and make himself known. Of course, this is a really important point because how is it that the limited can know the unlimited? And the only answer to that, not only in ontological terms, our relationship with God, but even in this world, how do you get, how do you get to know more about a person who's superior to you? There's only one answer, you have to submit. You can't do it by force. And only until that person agrees that I'm going to reveal myself to you. So Krishna therefore says, Bhakti mam abhijananti yavan yash chasmi tattvata tatumam tattvato gyatva vishite taranantaram. Only way that you enter into understanding me is through bhakti and submission. And that's uh, when the unlimited decides to reveal himself to the limited, then who's to stop him? Who can say that he can't do that? Obviously, he can reveal himself as much as he likes. Therefore, Tashi Krishna Namadi, Nabaved Grayam Indre, Sevam Muki Jivado, Swayam Eva Sparatyada. It's an important verse. So, if you, you know that yoga begins with the tongue and you start to serve Krishna through your tongue, how do you serve Krishna through your tongue, Gita? Do what? Definitely, you take prasadam. What's another way? <laughs> what? What? Chant the holy name. Very good. So you chant the holy name, you take prasadam. I mean, it's like last night we were talking about how it's not so easy. Prasadam, say you're living by yourself and you, like every night you offer or it's like the tongue wins out. You go like, no, just give it to me <laughs> straight. I mean, taking prasadam, you know, it's, there's a, it's a, it trans, it's, a, it's a real yoga, yoga of the tongue. And Krishna, when he's pleased, when he sees that this person's trying to please me, it's very personal. Then he reveals himself. Yes. Ruji, there was one more verse um, when oh, you good. were asking about the how people with imperfect senses if they write. Um, I'm this sorry, Miss that. Just go right ahead and say it again. This is uh, from Srimad Bhagavatam 1511. 
Tadvag Visargo in that translation. On the other hand, that literature which is full of descriptions of transcendental glories of name, fame, form, pastimes, etc., of unlimited Supreme Lord in a different creation, full of transcendental words directed towards bringing about a revolution in the impious lives of this world's mystic civilization. Such transcendental literatures, even though imperfectly composed, are heard, sung, and accepted by pure, purified men who are thoroughly honest. And tell us why you picked that verse. What's the context? Um, the previous uh, purport that we were reading from Ishu Upanishad, um, it is said that uh, you should follow a guru who is bona fide. And, and then, um, and I was just reflecting, uh, Sri Vatsa was talking to me last week. He was telling that he's doing a um, dissertation kind of a thing with his um, mentor at school. And um, he was saying something about Bhagavad Gita, um, and which he have never read Bhagavad Gita, but he was uh, giving commentary about Bhagavad Gita. So I was just think, uh, reflecting back, and then one of my colleagues sent me a video about somebody preaching about Hinduism, and they were taking part of the verses of the scriptures and leaving out the rest of it. So I was just thinking how bona fide um, literature is is so important, and the devotees were actually trying to really uh, glorify Krishna, even though their uh, composures are imperfect, but still it is accepted as the highest truth. Yes, time. yes, yeah. to, to the best of one's ability. At the end of the Chaitanya Charter movement, we find a very beautiful poetical section where Kaviraj Goswami is saying that now, uh, is it Chaitanya Bhagavat, I'm thinking? Yeah, that this small red-beaked bird has tried to describe the, the glories of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Birds fly in the, high, in the sky as, as high as they're able. The sky is unlimited, but birds, you know, they go as high as they can according to their ability. So I said, according to my ability, I've described as much as possible. And Prabhupada quotes this oftentimes to say that it's not that you have to glorify the Lord completely, because who can do that? However, if you do to the best of your ability, then Krishna will be pleased. And even if you have a, just a little bit of ability to do that, but you do it sincerely, then the, the, the process of purification takes place. By, because Krishna notices how one's sincerely trying to glorify him. Because he's a person. He's there within everyone's heart. Yes, from the internet. This is Bhakt Alex Zarinov. Oh, good. And he's quoting from Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, 1st chapter, verse number 4. Nirvita Tarse, Rupigi Yamana. Okay. That verse. 10 1 4. Nirvita Tarse, Rupigi Yamana, Bhav Ashodat, Shutra Mano Bhiramat. Ka uttama shloka gunanu vadat pumam raje yeta vina pashuknad. Glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is performed in the parampara system. That is, it is conveyed from the spiritual master to disciple. Such glorification is relished by those no longer interested in the false temporary glorification of this cosmic manifestation. Descriptions of the Lord are the right medicine for the conditioned soul undergoing repeated birth and death. Therefore, who will cease hearing such glorification of the Lord except a butcher or one who is killing his own self? And what was the context in which she was giving this verse? Um, I'm kind of just thinking that for, at the time when you were asking um, Shraddha about, you know, when we are preaching, why should we preach? Why can we not just speak from our own thing? Mm. Why do you follow disciplic suggestions? That's okay. That okay, good. Um, I want to go back to the first Trishapanishad verse. And um, we'll just uh, look at the summarized points Prabhupada makes of knowledge. That was uh, Sri Shupanishad text number 10. Is everyone okay? Okay. So go to the purport. And just um, listen to several of these to, to get an idea of the um, process of knowledge, the culture of knowledge. And number one, one should be a perfect gentleman and learn to give proper respect to others. 
So this is civility, and uh, incivility is very costly. It causes damage in uh, the social fabric, and uh, also disturbs people to no end. So uh, being a perfect gentleman to learn to give proper respect to others. And this is something that's also mentioned in various places that one can live a perfectly uh, progressive life if one learns how to give proper respect to others. Who can think of a place in Shastra where a guru gives a disciple instruction to learn how to properly respect others and by doing so become properly situated in life and in spiritual advancement and make spiritual advancement. Okay, can't you tell what I'm thinking? I'm thinking of Dhruva Maharaj and who instructs him to res learn to respect people properly. Yeah, what does he say? Let's look at it. Just find the verse. It's not in your shloka book, I guarantee you. But um, if somebody wants to grab the book off the shelf in a heroic act, he's already got it. Okay, what is it? 4834. How did you do that? I mean, we got the super pundits up in front tonight. 4834. He knows it right off the top of his head. Some kind of magic going on up here tonight. 4834. Okay. Guna dikan mudam lip said, Anu krosham guna damat, Maitram samanad, Anvich chen, Na ta par abibuyate. Translation. Now we'll look at the word for word. Oh, thanks. We have it right here. We're awash in transcendental literature here. Guna. Adikat. One who is more qualified. Mudam. Pleasure. Lipset. One should feel. Anukrosham. Compassion. Guna adamat. One who is less qualified. Maitrim. Friendship. Saman, samanat. With an equal... Anvichet, one should desire, na, not, tapai, by tribulation, abidiyate, abhi, uh, sorry, abibuyate, become affected. Translation, every man should act like this. When he meets a person more qualified than himself, he should be very pleased. When he meets someone less qualified than himself, he should be compassionate toward him. And when he meets someone equal to himself, he should make friendship with him. In this way, one is never affected by the threefold miseries of this material world. I have a question for all of you. How is it that one can become free from the miseries, threefold miseries of the material world? And we have the answer here. If you meet someone um, less qualified than you, you should be compassionate towards them. And if you meet someone as qualified towards as qualified as you, you should make friendship with them. And if you meet someone more qualified than you, you should be very pleased. Very pleased. Okay, excellent. This is the means by which one is never affected by the threefold miseries of the mature world. Ananta, what do you think? Do you like that verse? Oh, I'm going to read the purport. Purport. Generally, when we feel someone more qualified than ourselves, we become envious of him. When we find someone less qualified, we deride him. And when we find someone equal, we become very proud of our activities. These are the causes of all material tribulations. The great sage Narada therefore advised that a devotee should act perfectly. Instead of being envious of a more qualified man, one should be jolly to receive him. Instead of being oppressive to a less qualified man, one should be compassionate toward him just to raise him to the proper standard. And when one meets an equal, instead of being proud of one's own activities before him, one should treat him as a friend. One should also have compassion for the people in general who are suffering due to forgetfulness of Krishna. 
These important functions will make one happy within this material world. Priya Kishori, go for it. I was, um, I found it very interesting that uh, Srila Prabh uh, Prabhupada is saying that one should be proper gentleman, be proper human being and have um, this uh, proper attitude. And in this verse, um, he's saying the cause of all tribulation is because um, one has envy. And when reflecting on that, the very reason we're in this material world is because we were envious to Krishna, because he was so like so qualified and we were envious of that. And when we look at the opportunity we have in a spiritual community, we have the opportunity to respect elders and uh, senior devotees and guru. Um, we have the opportunity to learn cooperation amongst peers and go and preach with them um, to those who are more unfortunate. So this environment gives us the ability to overcome such tribulations. And that's why you're so happy, <laughs> right? Uh, yes, Govinda. It was there a minute ago. It'll come right back. Uh, any any practical realization of this? He's got it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as the tapatra unmulanam is also mentioned in one point one point two, and uh, of Srimad Bhagavatam, right? So, but just by reading Srimad Bhagavatam, we can actually eliminate the threefold miseries of life. Yes. Tapatra unmulanam. Yes. By yes, Shraddha, go for it. I was saying that also in the prasadam prayers, um, the, the, the extra verse that we have from Bhagavatam, it also says that if you put on the garlands that have been worn by the Lord or the clothes that he wears or food that has been left, then also maya does not have effect on you. Yes. So it's remarkable, isn't it, that if one, this is one of the features of knowledge. It's very practical. That's why I wanted to go back to the Sri Shapanishad purport because the first a step, and it's very deep in attaining equilibrium in this world and actually becoming free from the f fetters of the modes of material nature is t is to act properly in one's relationships. Priya again. I just had over the last few days the opportunity to interact with um, some people who um, they're not devotees, but they're very, very knowledgeable in the field that they have studied. And one thing I noticed about their the, the way they conducted themselves is that because their knowledge was so deep in whatever subject matter it may be, they conducted themselves with so much humility um, and um, a lack of pride for what they had. And um, especially when we carry this knowledge of a spiritual life and all this, then it's e it, we can drive, derive from that principle that the concomitant factor is to be more um, humble. Thank you. Mukharvin. Maharaj, this uh, one song um, in which that Guru Dev Kripa Bindu Diyakaru, in that one line says that Sakala Sahane Karite Sakati Deho Nath Jata Jata, that says that, that Oh, spiritual master, please give me that power to respect every living entity according to their. Um, I remember. Yes. Yes. Uh, whenever in all Vyas pujas, we. That's right. <laughs> it's a very. Uh, it's a real shakti to be able to do that, Prabhu. Maharaj, I was remembering Radhika Raman Prabhu's lecture last year, where, where uh, his seminar on forgiveness, where he mentioned a very nice point that. Uh, in the Trinadapi uh, verse, uh, out of Amanina and Manadena, uh, not expecting respect and giving respect to all others. Not expecting respect is somewhat tougher, but giving respect to others is easier. Yeah. At least we get some reciprocation. We also <laughs> 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 That's what he mentioned. So at least if we begin practicing that, then... Uh, Amanina also can come naturally, gradually. Yeah, that's such a nice point. Thank for bringing that up. Yeah. And I, I just wanted, I, and when I think of that verse, Trinadapi Suniche, you know, and the translation that one should be ready for these things, it always reminds me that you know we get ready for so many other things before you walk out the door. He's like, "Do I look okay?" You know, it's like, "Is this straight?" Uh, and but, but you know, am I ready as I walk out psychologically to not uh, 
take respect from others or expect it? Or am I, res am I ready to give respect to others? So one should, this is one of the tenets of, of uh, knowledge and of being in a state in which one could commune with the holy name is to, to keep oneself in that humble position and that's really what it means. So that's something that one could um, put on the inventory to check before one walks out the door and interacts with others, including one's spouse. Come on, smile. All right. All right, was there one more point before I use up all the time for our kirtan? Yeah. Um, I, I was just reminded of the six verses starting from 12, 13, Bhagavad Gita. Yes. Adhvishta Sarubhutanam, Mad Bhakta Priya. So that, that series in which Lord gives a lot of qualities that he would like to see in a yes. devotee of his. Yes. So I think that is that should be our manifesto for for ISV. Let's do that. Let's study the, this and uh, some of the other places where Krishna mentions the qualities that he would like to see in others and that gives him happiness. Why don't we all study that and make that the man, our manifesto and uh, the, the the beacon for our uh, practice and the, uh, the ways we conduct ourselves in life? What do you all think? You agree, eh? Yes. So let's start it in earnest today. And we'll practice this uh, showing respect to others and not expecting respect in turn. And we'll look at all the other tenets. And so uh, start making notes of these things before the weekend of any of the, the qualities you see that Krishna mentions that are especially endearing to him. And then we can share uh, and try to actually practice it before you get, we get here on Saturday. Okay? Let's try it and see what happens. Thank you. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakti Vrinda Sarasanga Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 
हरे 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 राम रे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 
Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Go Premanande So uh, one of the uh, um, um, most intimate of services that one can perform for the Supreme Personality of God it is cooking and uh, one of the reasons that we have a uh, temple especially with a, a commercial kitchen is to, so that we can uh, be um, ever progressive in increasing the quality of our cooking and the standards of our cooking so all of you are uh, Vaishnavas and therefore um, it's a service that you can learn if you don't know it already and if you already know uh, how to cook you can uh, put yourself uh, more and more into the to the service but it is definitely one of the ways to um, conquer the hearts of people in the world and come very close to Krishna is through cooking so th please meditate on this because we would like to make ISV one of the uh, uh, um, most famous temples in the world for its cooking and uh, take it very seriously and uh, qualify yourself also for cooking, to cook for the deities. One should have brahminical initiation and um, make this your life and soul. And then your life will be perfect. And everyone else will love you too. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for considering my request. Hare Bol. And um, 
Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Everybody will see you on Saturday. For, the, um, for those who joined us online, everyone please uh, thank them by saying Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. And now we'll put away all the asanas and we'll remove this beautiful carpet and uh, we'll clear the dance floor for tonight's Arctic ceremony. So feel free to let yourself go and dance for the Lord. And thank you very much. Hare Krishna.